Now let me come back to our subject, and in case you forgot what it was, it's when Elijah and God were a majority. Martin Luther is credited with the statement, one with God is a majority. He at least knew the accuracy of that statement by experience. And there is another who experienced the truth of this epigrammatic statement, and that man, of course, was Elijah. He was uh, his ministry was cast in the days of Ahab and Jezebel when there was a wholesale departure of the northern kingdom from God. And they plunged into idolatry and the worship of calf, the calf worship of Baal at both Samaria and Bethel. This man stood in that day alone. His voice alone was lifted in defense of Jehovah and his word. Now, it is true that there were 7,000 that had not bowed the knee to Baal, but they had retreated to the mountains. And they not only had not only not bowed their knee, they had not opened their mouth either. None of them stood with Elijah. In fact, he was not even aware of their presence until God called him to his attention that there were still 7,000. I know he developed a complex, and I think you would have too. He said, I alone am left. And God had to call his attention to the fact that he wasn't really alone, and yet he did stand alone against the enemy in that day. He refused to compromise with the prophets of Baal. And when they wrote a new confession of faith, and rejected the authority of the Word of God, he denounced it. And he didn't say, just because I'm a hopeless minority, I'll have to go along with this. He took a definite stand. He took a stand against the calf worship of that day. And the fact of the matter is, they had a new morality in that day. The only thing is, it wasn't even new then. It went back even to the Tower of Babel and before the flood. This idea of new morality, which is sex worship, was in existence in Elijah's day. It was that which brought uh, the flood upon the earth, and certainly Sodom and Gomorrah knew a great deal about it. It was Dr. Wilfred Funk, the outstanding lexicographer, who made a list of the ten most expressive words in the English language. And he said that the most bitter word is the word alone. Well, Elijah stood alone. He did not voice public opinion. He was no echo. He was not a sounding board for any group or any individual or any party at all. He was not a parrot saying something that somebody else had said. He was more concerned about pleasing God than courting the popularity of the crowd. He sought divine approval rather than public applause. He was not a clown in the, in the street parade, but rather he was a fool for God's sake. His was a solo voice in the wilderness of this world, and he carried on an all-out war against Satan and his minions. He stood alone on Mount Carmel, arrayed against the prophets of Baal. It was The odds were hopelessly against him. He made a dramatic stance there for God, and he was the one who chose Mount Carmel. After all, it's a dramatic spot itself. I stood there about two years ago, and as I stood in what is called a traditional spot where Elijah met the prophets of Baal, may I say that it's one of the most picturesque spots you could be in. Right down in front was the Bay of Haifa, and the blue Mediterranean is not bluer anywhere than is spread out beneath the foot of Mount Carmel. And this mountain goes back as a shoulder for miles. 
May I say that this man chose that place. And that day we took a long trip, and that night we retired early. Uh, we were staying at the Dan Carmel Hotel, which is up on top, by the way, and not too far from the spot. And I went out on the little lanai that we had that overlooked the bay and overlooked this spot. And as I sat there that evening, I could visualize that man, Elijah, in a day when he alone stood for God. And in that lonely place, he marshaled all of his forces against the prophets of Baal. And the advantage that he had was a tremendous advantage, and that was God was on his side, or rather he was on the side of God. And he had no, no failing whatsoever. There was no faltering on his part because he recognized that God was with him. His lone and majestic figure stood apart, detached from the others. And he made the most of it. This man, there's no question but what he was dramatic. He, first of all, looked bored at the whole proceedings of all of these prophets running up and down. And then I think he had an ironic smile upon his face. And then he began to use the acid of sarcasm. He said, maybe your God's gone on a vacation. It's summertime anyway. He used the rapier of ridicule. He told them, why don't you yell louder? Maybe he's hard of hearing. He taunted and jeered the prophets of Baal, and finally with wilting scorn he waved them aside. And then he began to rear God's altar. He began to lay the sticks in place, and the waters poured there. And then he stood there, the most helpless man in the world, and yet the most powerful man in the world, as he looked up. And again, I think, with that smile upon his face, he said, Oh God, if you don't move, nothing will happen in this hour. But I want to say to you, something did happen in that hour, and the fire of heaven came down. Now, it's difficult this morning to refrain from preaching on that event, but that actually is not our subject this morning. I want to move on from there, because this man after this defied Ahab and Jezebel. There was no compromise. He denounced them. And you immediately begin to ask, what is the secret of this man? Because he is a remarkable man. He was not a writing prophet, actually. He wrote no book in the Old Testament. Isaiah did. Ezekiel did. Jeremiah did. Hosea did. Daniel did. But there's no book named Elijah. He was not illiterate. We have a writing that he sent to the king, but he had actually... He had written no book, yet he is the one prophet that is remembered above all the other prophets. And the Old Testament closes with the promise that before that great and notable day, God says, I will send you Elijah the prophet. He's to come back and conclude his ministry. That was the promise that the Old Testament closes with. And from that day right down to the present moment, the orthodox of the nation Israel looked for him to come. And at the Passover feast, they still will put a place for Elijah, who is to come. They haven't forgotten him. He was with Christ on the Mount of Transfiguration, and he knew all about the death of Christ before it took place because he and Moses discussed with the Lord Jesus that decease that he was to accomplish at Jerusalem. And in the book of Revelation, we see in the last days there will appear two witnesses. And I believe that most commentaries and commentators and expositors, regardless of the position that they hold in prophecy, will agree that Elijah is one of them. He is the one. There's some disagreement about the second one, 
And I'm going to make a suggestion this morning. But may I say to you that this man, even was when John the Baptist appeared, they said, this is Elijah. And even when the Lord Jesus Christ himself appeared, he said, whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, some say you are John the Baptist, and others are saying you're Elijah. That is to come. May I say to you, what is the secret of this man who towers like a giant on the pages of Scripture? And I'd remind ourselves this morning that he's no superman. He's no Batman. He is not Agent 007. Uh, he is a man, as James says in a pragmatic way, Elijah was a man subject to the like passions as we are. He's the same kind of an individual that you are here this morning. He was no different at all. And yet he was different. This man, he comes in out of the rain and he goes out in a chariot of fire. And in between, he's bringing fire down from heaven and he's interlacing it with thunder and lightning. No man ever had quite the career that this man had. And that's the way that he walks out on the page of Scripture. And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. And may I say to you, it took courage to walk into the court in Ahab and Jezebel and say anything like that. But he said it. And then God took this man aside because he's going to have a couple of years on his hands and there's not going to be rain for two years. They're going to have a drought. And Elijah actually will not have much to do. And so God takes him aside and gives him a course. And he put him where he always puts his man. I don't know why God has done this, but every man that God has ever trained, he's trained him on the desert. You can go through the Bible and look at that. Forty years of training in the palace of the sun in Egypt and a, and a graduate of the temple of the sun did not prepare Moses to lead the children of Israel. God put him out on the desert for 40 years. And then God called him to lead his people. That was the way that God trained this man Joshua. He trained him in the wilderness. And that's the man that he chose to lead his people. When God was looking for a king, he went out yonder to the sheepfold and took a boy that knew what it was to rough it. A boy that had already been trained, but he's not ready and God put him out in the caves and dens of the earth to hide from King Saul and while, while he trained him. And then, my friend, here is Elijah. And then John the Baptist. God put him in the wilderness. And then God took Paul the Apostle, a brilliant, polished, young theologian, a man acquainted with Greek philosophy, but God can't use him. And God put him out in the desert of Arabia. And when God really wanted this man John to write a book that would end the Word of God, he didn't pick him while he's even an apostle or while he's pastor of the church in Ephesus. He exiles him on the Isle of Patmos. And in that rugged spot, God uses him. That's been God's method. It's not strange, therefore, that God said to this man, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Kirith, that is before Jordan. Now God is going to give this man a three-year course in two years in theology, that he might be prepared to be used of God. And this is a course that, candidly, I wish that they had in our theological seminaries today. There's too much. Actually, today, in 
most of our so-called Christian schools of that which is theory and that which is not practical. That which is not something that you put in shoe leather and walk in, but rather that which goes up in the air like a balloon. That's the type of thing today that, that doesn't prepare a man to be used of God. God sends this man out now to the brook Kirith. And I wish to say this morning that I do not know where the brook Kirith is. And I've read everything that I can get on it, and I'm confident that nobody else knows where it is. In fact, God sent this man out to a secret place, and it's so secret that after 1900 years since Christ came, nobody can put his finger down on it. Now, I know they pointed out to me there that's east or west of Jericho, the spot where St. George's uh, monastery is today, and they say that's it. But that's not it to begin with. If you'll notice the language here, it says, turn the eastward, which actually means to get to the east side of the Jordan River. And the spot they point out to you is on the west side of the Jordan River. And this is some spot not down near the Dead Sea where they point it out today, but obviously up near the Sea of Galilee, probably the most rugged terrain that there is in that land. And God put this man there at the brook Kirib. Now he uses here a twofold method to supply his need. One is supernatural. The ravens brought him bread and flesh. And no man ever had it so good as this man did. Had black waiters serving him twice a day. Uh, they brought him bread and flesh. But God used a natural means. God used the brook for him to get his water. And the brook there, evidently fed by springs. But there came a day when the brook began to dry up. Because you see, they were in the midst of drought. I do not know that Elijah did this. But since he's a man of like passions as we are, I know what I would have done. I would have cut down a little stick a stob. I would have driven it in the water. I would have measured each day how much the water went down, and then I would figure out the day I would starve to death, because that would be the normal and natural thing to do. You're dependent now upon this natural means, this brook, and the brook is drying up. And so this man spent some time there, and he actually stayed there till he saw that that brook dried up entirely. I want to say to you that that was a tremendous lesson for him to learn. It's wonderful to be fed by the ravens. And there are a lot of folk today that want it that way. And I do believe that God today still uses supernatural means. But God also uses natural means, and through those natural means, he teaches us a tremendous lesson. I think that this man, Elijah, could go down and look at that brook every day, and he could say, my life is dependent upon this empty brook. In fact, I can make an equation out of this, and I can say that my life equals a dried-up brook. He could say, and certainly he learned the lesson, that his life was no more than a dried-up brook. That was all. The man that can walk to the top of Mount Carmel and have water poured by the barrelfuls on an offering and then bring down fire from heaven, must learn that he's nothing in the world but a dried-up brook. When our Lord was ready to furnish the refreshment for a wedding feast, he had them bring out those old 
water jugs, and then he says he started with them empty. <laughs> then he filled them with water. May I say to you this morning, one of the reasons today that God cannot use many of us, we are already filled up with something else. God always starts with that which is empty. And Elijah had to learn that if he's going to be used of God, that all he is is a dried-up brook. But if he is a dried-up brook, that's the kind of a brook that God can make the water of life flow through. And the water of life can flow through only that which is empty. I think that's so lovely, that, that wedding, empty, filled with water, then it becomes wine. Where did it become wine? He didn't say hocus pocus over it. Somewhere between the time they ladled it out. And I think when they ladled it out, it was water. But when it reached the guests, it had been changed. He starts today with an empty vessel. He'll fill that vessel with water, which is the Word of God. And then he wants to ladle that water out. And when that water is ladled out by the Spirit of God, it becomes the very joy and the salvation of those that will receive it. You see, God looking for empty vessels. Oh, we have talent today. We have today enough talent to convert Southern California. And that's the problem. If we could only get a few empty vessels, if we could only get a few empty brooks, because it's only through the empty brook that the water of life can flow. And Christ says, I'm the water of life, not you, not me. I want a vessel. I want an empty, empty brook dried up. And you bring that to me, and I can fill it. Elijah had to learn that before he went to the top of Mount Carmel. I've been rather reluctant to criticize some man that God's using today. And the reason is just simply this. It's so easy to point to the prophets of Baal and ridicule them today. But my brother, my sister, are you bringing any fire down from heaven today yourself? And until you do, you better be careful about criticizing the man God's using. So easy today to tell the other man. So easy today to sit in judgment but God is not looking for judges. He's looking for a dried-up brook. And so he used Elijah. That was his first year in seminary. He got that course in a few months. Then, when the brook dried up, God had no notion of letting him die of starvation. It came to pass after a while that the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. And I also drove through Zarephath. It's a miserable little town even today, but it's in a beautiful location. It's right on the Mediterranean Sea. It's in Lebanon today, what is today Lebanon. And it's, oh, there are lovely, beautiful orchards around there. The cherries uh, were trees were in bloom when I was there. The oranges were uh, getting yellow. And I want to say this, it's a dangerous thing to say this so close to the sun-kissed building down here, but those oranges over there taste like oranges. My, they were delicious. It's a lovely spot, but there'd been a drought. 
And now God sends him up to this place that we can locate. No one knows where Kirith is, but everyone can know where Zarephath is. And I do not know the reaction of this man, but I'm confident, since he's a man of like passions as we are, that he would have rebelled as I would have. I'd have said, look, Lord, you really don't mean that you're sending me up there and going to let a widow woman take care of me? I'm a big, strong, healthy man. Let me take care of myself. God says, you go up there. And when he got there, he found out that she and her son and her family were in a desperate situation. And the desperate situation was that the barrel of flour that they had That barrel of meal was just about empty. fact of the matter is, there was one more meal in the barrel. And the cruise of oil, it was in the same condition. Just enough for one more meal, and the widow woman had reconciled herself that she and her family would now starve to death. And that's not unusual. There have been literally thousands starved to death in India and in other parts of the world today. And if you are reading what's being written today by these agricultural experts, they consider what's happening in India the beginning of a worldwide famine that will next spread to South America and will finally, the last place it will come is to this country. I don't know whether they're right or not. If a preacher said that, they'd call him a fanatic. But these men are experts. They've written the book, and that book is out now, and I understand is receiving a great deal of attention. But this widow woman was prepared to die. Now, God has instructed Elijah to join himself there. And in his uh, very brusque and abrupt manner, He walks up, sees what she's doing, gathering sticks. He says to her, go get me some water. And she does. Now he says, I want you to prepare me a meal. She said, I'm very sorry, but that's what I was doing, gathering these sticks. It's the last meal that we'll have. She said, as the Lord God, thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks that I may go in and dress it for me and my son that we may eat it and die. Now, they're in a terrible condition, and that's not a very good place to send a man in order that he might live through a drought. Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said, But make me thereof a little cake first, and bring it unto me, and after make for thee and for thy son. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, The bale of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruse of oil fail, until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. Now this man, Elijah, for almost two years, one year plus, he went every day and stuck his head down in that barrel and there's always just enough for one more meal. But this man, when he put his head down in that barrel, he sang the doxology every day. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. And he and this family, they ate out of that barrel as we've said, for almost two years. Now again, here is his second year in theology. Not only is his life a dried-up brook, but it's also an empty flower barrel. That's all in the world that he is. There's always a danger today, and we're living in a day when One of the characteristics, Paul says, will be pride. Characterizing those of the last days, he said they are proud, arrogant. And we're living in a day when we see so much of that, and it gets even among Christians today. 
And there are many of us feel like we can do something for God. I do not want to insult you this morning, but there are, there's not a person in the sound of my voice today that can do anything for God. Not a thing. All that you and I are, we're just an empty flower barrel. And my friend, when you're an empty flower barrel, nobody can eat out of you. You can't supply anybody with anything out of an empty flower barrel. But when an empty flower barrel is put into the hands of God, it can supply bread for nearly two years. And that was, to my judgment, one of the most dedicated flower barrels that's ever been on top side of this earth. This man, Elijah, go every day as he looked at that brook, he could look at the barrel and said, well, I certainly didn't have any water of life in me, and I don't have any bread of life in me either. All that I am I'm just a dried-up brook and an empty flower barrel. But that's the kind of a barrel God wanted, was an empty flower barrel. I'm confident of this, that if that flower barrel had been full to the brim, they would have eaten out of it naturally until it was all gone. I do not know how long it would have lasted, not too long, but they would have eaten out of it and they would have looked to the flower barrel. But when you've got an empty flower barrel, you're going to start looking to God, my friend. I think the greatest curse that there is today in America, and I think God's judged us with prosperity, the greatest curse is the supermarket. Why in the world should anybody ask God, give us this day our daily bread when Alpha Beta's got it all for us and you don't have to go to the Alpha and Omega. You just go to Alpha Beta, and I ought to give the others a little publicity. Safeway does pretty well too. We depend on them and we don't need to depend on God today. Oh, my friend this morning. We are just an empty flower barrel. But God can let people get the bread of life out of it if we recognize we're an empty flower barrel. But when you and I start passing out bread, it may even be made with honey, and a lot of it's being made today with honey, it won't feed folk. The interesting thing about bread is that it has all of the elements that you and I need to sustain life. I'm told this old body I've got has about 15 or 16 chemicals in it, and all of them are in bread. And again, may I say, I don't mean the bread that is made in the bakeries today. I mean the bread that they had in that day where nothing was thrown away. It wasn't near as tasty today as the bread we get, but it had everything in it that the human body needed. And God today has the bread of life. The Lord Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He said, I am the water of life. And if the water of life is to get out to anyone, he'll have to have an empty vessel. If the bread of life is to get out to anyone, he'll have to have an empty vessel. God can't use that which is filled. Now will you notice the last that is mentioned here. After the months went by, it came to pass after these things that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, fell sick, and his sickness was so sore that there was no breath left in him. Now Elijah does a very strange thing. He said unto her, Give me thy son. He took him out of her bosom and carried him up into a loft where he abode and he laid him upon his own bed, and he cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord, my God, hast thou also brought evil upon the widow with whom I sojourned by slaying her son? 
He stretched himself upon the sun three times. And I think that's very suggestive that Christ was three days and three nights dead in the tomb and cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord, my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come into him again. I want to talk to Elijah someday about why he did it this way, but I think I already know the answer. Because when he was with the Lord Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, he talked about the decease that Christ was to accomplish in Jerusalem. And he probably knew more about the death and resurrection of Christ than the average church member knows today. He knew enough to discuss it intelligently with the Lord Jesus Christ. And here is a great principle. As Elijah put the dead body of that boy down upon that bed and looked at it, not only can he say now, I'm a dried-up brook, I'm an empty flower bell, but I'm a dead body. There's no life in me. But he did something. He put his body against the body of that, of that boy. I'd like to ask him why he did that. May I be suggestive this morning? I think he will say someday when I ask him the question. I think he'll say, well, McGee, I knew a long time before Christ came that the only way that you and I, who are dead in trespasses and sins, can have life is by contact with a person. It won't be going through a ceremony. It won't be saying hocus pocus. It won't be joining something. It won't be going through some ritual. It will be contact with a person. And my friend, this morning, life, eternal life, comes by contact with Jesus Christ and no other way. You can join this church ten times and it will not give you life. And you can join every church in Southern California and you can go through every ritual and you can make all kinds of promises. But until you come to Christ, come to Him personally, and have contact with him, you're dead in trespasses and sin. What a principle. And so yonder on the mount, he discusses with the Lord Jesus the decease that he was to accomplish because he took my death, I am dead, under the judgment and penalty of sin, and he bore that for me. But when he came back from the dead, he came back for me buried with him by identification, raised with him in newness of life. And if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. That's the point today. Elijah knew that. Now God's going to let him graduate from seminary because this is the great lesson that you must learn. I believe that this was the lesson that another very brilliant man had to learn. And it was Paul the Apostle, and I'm through now, but let me just refer to him. In 1 Corinthians 1, 27, But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. And Paul said, If any man has whereof to glory, I more. Paul said, I... I could boast of things of the flesh. And believe me, he had them. But he says, I count all of that but dung 
that I might win Christ and be found in Him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but the righteousness of Christ, which is by faith. And Paul said, I trusted Him. I want to turn to one more verse that he used. In Galatians 4.13, Paul says, Ye know how through infirmity of the flesh I preached the gospel unto you at the first, and my temptation which was in my flesh ye despise not, nor rejected, but receive me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. I don't know this, but I think Paul in person, and by this statement and one he made to the Corinthians, I'm of the opinion that he suffered from disease, which apparently was eye trouble, and apparently there was pus running down his face all the time. I'm of the opinion that if you had heard him, it would almost make you sick to sit and listen to him. But the interesting thing is, this man knew that, and he knew that it all depended upon the power of God and not upon his looks. And so this man, Paul, he went out to preach the gospel because he too knew he was a dried-up brook. He too knew that he was an empty flower bear. He too not only knew but said, dead in trespasses and sins. And then I came in contact with Christ. And this is the man that speaks of the offense of the cross. There are several reasons why the cross is an offense. I have a little book on that, and I emphasize something else. But let me mention this this morning. What is the offense of the cross? Why is it offensive today? It's offensive because it is a picture of weakness and defeat. That's the reason. God hath chosen things that are not. God hath chosen the weak things. And God today hinges the salvation of this world on the weakness of that cross. Have you ever noticed when they were gathered around it, even that crowd there that day, and men today don't like it, they don't like that cross. That's weakness. Why doesn't he come down? Why doesn't he ride into Jerusalem on a white charger? Why doesn't he do something spectacular and great? Satan suggested that. Five classes of people were at the foot of the cross. And their attitude was all the same. The common crowd, they passed by wagging their heads. Ha! Oh, thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself and come down from the cross. That's what they wanted. Show us something. If you stay there, it's weakness, it's death, it's defeat. The Jewish ruler said he saved others. Himself he cannot save. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down from the cross and we'll believe him. The railing malefactor. If thou art the King of the Jews, save thyself and us. The superstitious and curious mob there said, listen to what he's saying. He's calling Elijah. Let be. Let us see whether Elijah will come and take him down from the cross. No, Elijah won't. Elijah's already been talking to him about that. And Elijah already knows because he was a dead body. He was an empty flower bear. He was a dried-up brook. All of these people said, Save thyself! In the crowd there that day, 
hanging on the other cross was a poor thief. He alone said, Save me. Save me. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. He saw in that cross the power of God unto salvation. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the dynamite of God unto salvation. My friend this morning, what do you see in that cross? Are you today trying to save yourself? You are saying today, there's plenty of water in me, plenty of bread in me. I'm still able to take care of myself. I'm no dead body. I'm very much alive. I'll work this out myself. No, you won't. No, you won't. God said, You're a dried up brook. You're an empty flower bough. You're a dead body. But he says, if you'll come to me, come to that place of weakness, come to that place of seeming defeat, come to the cross, I died for you. And the reason I didn't come down from that cross was so I could save you. And he died this morning so He can save you. He wants to save you. He's able to save you. He's able to save to the uttermost those who will come unto God through Him.